All right, I'm showing that the time is in fact 1130 Central Time. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, my name is Ben Wilson. Today we're going to talk uh, for the Central Arizona chapter of CCIM. We're going to talk about all the latest and greatest things at CCIM. Um, and specifically within the technology realm of site to do business. Um, we're going to start off um, and we're going to kind of work our way through the different tools. We're going to spend the majority of our time in business analyst, uh, really the last six um, of the tools and, and activities that we're going to go through are going to be um, all within business analyst, but we're going to start off with uh, pictometry, aerial imagery. Um, if at any point throughout today's presentation you have any questions, please feel free to ask those into the question and answer box. I'd be happy to get to those as soon as I see those come in. Uh, if, if for whatever reason they don't um, are kind of are simultaneous with what we're, we're working on, I'll be sure to circle back to those at the end of the presentation. Uh, but I really appreciate everyone's time today. I hope everyone is having a great day. Uh, so with that, we're going to go ahead and st get started. Again, we've got seven different kind of new things that are available in site to do business. So some of you might have come across some of these things uh, just by happenstance or, or sought them out. Um, uh, but but we think that they're really good and, and we want to be able to show those to you today. So we're going to start off with um, once you get logged into site to do business, we're just going to get into pictometry. And this is just, I um, wanted everyone to be aware of our, uh, the, there's a massive new update to pictometry aerial imagery. Now the formatting is all going to look very similar, uh, but I think what will probably make most people happy is the fact that the imagery has been updated. Uh, in primary markets, just about every market in the country um, in those primary markets has been updated within the last calendar year. So if we were to take a look at 7650 South McClintock Drive, Tempe, Arizona. And again, this is just from the pictometry application. Uh, we're gonna get a pen dropped on the map. And you're going to see that that image was taken on October 13th of 2019. Now, a couple of other things about this imagery. Uh, you, of course, can go back in time all the way back to 2006 if you're interested in doing that. Um, you can turn on different layers, such as street names and places, contours, as well as parcel boundaries. Um, and you can also capture that image as a PDF if that's something of interest to you as well. You can zoom out and zoom in. Uh, you can rotate the imagery and you can also toggle between this zoomed in version as well as uh, the community level. So the neighborhood level is being the more zoomed in level. Uh, the community level is going to be um, more of a um, uh, screenshot of the entire area. So oh, I just wanted to make sure that we did mention that. So brand new update to pictometry. Uh, that was back in um, August. There was a big update. And so we have new aerial imagery. We're very excited about that. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to work through uh, some different exercises um, within business analysts. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is the new 2020 data that's available. But we're also going to talk about actual new reports that are available in the system. So you might not have come across these reports if you um, haven't spent a whole lot of time in the site recently, uh, but you'll see here uh, some greatest 2020 data as well as new reports. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna begin uh, by creating a study area from 4144 East Indian Road. So once I'm logged into Business Analyst, um, I can go to find a location and I type in 4144 East Indian and that's sorry. And that's Phoenix, Arizona. So I'm going to drop a pin on the map and I'm going to create my study area as a five minute drive time. So if I just click down here on add an area run my study area, we're just going to keep this simple. It's going to be a five minute drive time. Uh, also keep in mind, if you want to, you can go into more options there. You can change your drive times to rural dr driving times, trucking times, use live traffic. But in this case, we're just interested in the five minute drive time. And We've got a couple of reports that we want to run. We want to run the civilian labor force profile 
the time series profile and the community profile. We're gonna run all three of those reports at once. So once we've created our study area, we're gonna select run reports. And up here at the top of the screen, you'll see selected sites. I've got my selected site turned on. Uh, that's my five minute drive time. And you'll notice that there's two different options for running reports. There's infographics and there's classic reports. Now we're gonna get to um, the infographics in just a couple of minutes, but we're gonna start off with our classic reports. And the reports that we're interested in um, are reports that we've done updates to or are brand new. So the first one is the civilian labor force profile. That's brand new. Um, the community profile has been updated. And then I'm also going to run the time series profile. And so if I go back to my sheet here, I'm gonna go ahead and run all these reports as a PDF, but I've got a couple of questions that I want to have answered about this site. And so when I toggle back over to my other screen here, we've got questions like what age group has the lowest unemployment rate? Well, this is uh, data from the civilian labor force profile. So the civilian labor force profile, in my opinion, is one of the best new reports that Esri's come out with in a long time. Um, not only are you gonna get the of employed, unemployed, employment rate, labor force participation rate, and employment population ratio, you're also going to get major industries, as well as the location quotient for those major industries. So if you're not familiar with location quotient, what it does is it compares the area that you're actually looking at, so your analysis area, and it compares it to the national average. So 1.00 is the national average, and so if you're looking for, uh, to kind of find out what the specialty of your market is, you can run this report to find out exactly what the location quotient is. So uh, um, if you're in Midland, Texas, there's a lot of oil and gas production. What you would see actually in mining, coring, and gas, um, you get a number like 32 for the location quotient. Um, if you were doing something like um, a retail trade around like a major shopping center, what you would find is like a very large location uh, quotient or manufacturing or construction. So you can get an idea of what the, the real dominant factors are uh, in a market. And then you also get the breakdown of occupation. So white collar, blue collar, service industry. Um, so all of that information is in the civilian labor force profile. But back to our question, if we wanted to know what age has the lowest unemployment rate, uh, what we would find here is that the lowest unemployment rate is actually going to be that 65 plus. Um, you also notice that they have a, a much lower labor force participation rate, but that un unemployment rate uh, is going to be the lowest at 9.4%. Uh, this is done on a 12 month rolling average. And so um, Um, and I just saw a question come in is why isn't there a negative location quotient? So what it has to do with it is if, um, if one is the national average, 0, 0.00 is the lowest that can go. So if there are no people involved in a single um, industry type, it would be zero uh, as opposed to a negative number. So, so what you can see is that percentage here in mining and gas, despite the fact that there are a few people in, involved in that employment. Uh, sector, uh, that's so much lower than the national average that what you're going to see is that location quotient is actually zero um, as far as a percentage goes. Great question. Um, and so um, back, back to our, our Second question here, what we have is, um, what industry has the highest location quotient for this five minute drive time? So if we're here looking for the uh, industry type as opposed to occupation, what we would find I think is actually the highest is gonna be this 1.95. That's gonna be real estate, rental and leasing. Um, is gonna be the highest in this five minute drive time. Now keep in mind, it's just based on the five minute drive time that I created. It's not for Phoenix proper. It's not for um, you know a mile ring. It's for that five minute drive time. So directly correlated with that study area. And if we just scroll down, what is the breakdown of daytime population? So this is a great number to be able to look at, daytime population. But one of the neat things about the com community profile is it's actually broken that data out one more layer because it's about daytime population and um, all being lumped into one, you get two different numbers here. You get the resident population, daytime population. You also get the worker daytime population. So you can see that that number uh, is 56,703. 
Um, but if you go to your workers, that's 31,703 versus your residents is 25,000. So you can get an idea of the breakdown in that community profile. So people often ask me, what, is my, what are some of my favorite reports? Well, three of them that I'm running here today, um, all new reports uh, or adjusted reports, the time series profile, the community profile, as well as that civilian labor force profile are definitely all in that category. And then lastly, we have the civilian, or uh, excuse me, the time series profile. So if we scroll down to the time series profile, one of the unique things about this report, it's the only report you're gonna have with Insight to Do Business that gives you year by year annual change across the last decade. And so we have population, we have households, we have housing units, um, and it, it's gonna give you the population change over, over time. And so a pretty unique little study here. So in this, within this five minute drive time, uh, we see population increases of numbers like 373, 176, 47, 172, 477. The biggest growth here is going to be kind of, uh, kind of in the middle 2000 uh, teens, the 2016, 17, you see growth of 900 people, 971, 871, 2019, 303. You actually see a drop off in 2020, uh, negative 89. And so you can get a feel for how things have changed in, in an area. And then you can also look at the way that the numbers have changed for, for households data. Sometimes you'll see that households will, data will lag. Uh, sometimes you'll see that it will actually be ahead of the total population changes. So, um, Pretty good information there. Um, if you're looking for where the largest growth was um, from a population standpoint, you'd see that it actually happened between 2016, 2017, and then that 2017 to 18, right in there is gonna be your, your top population changes. So that's just basic reporting, but I did want you to be aware of some of the changes to the reports. And so the next thing I wanna do is I wanna talk about one of the new infographics. I'm gonna use the same study area that I just ran, uh, but I wanna show you some of the new infographics. If you're not familiar with them, probably the easiest way to look at them is if you go into build reports and build infographics, now you don't actually have to go through the process of building your own reports. That's not really what the the, the point is here, the point is for you to be able to visualize all of these different infographics. So there is a brand new template that's just been added. It's the coronavirus impact planning up in the top left hand corner. Uh, I think it's a great new report that, uh, especially in today's time, uh, where, where so many people are interested in uh, you know, di different factors that might be affecting uh, coronavirus um, and, and how that's affecting real estate. And so, so that report was created that's brand new. But then we also have these other 20 templates that are available. Um, these are all standard templates, but there's also shared templates. Um, you can definitely take a look at some of those shared templates. It's amazing what some of the people have done. But uh, just to kind of give you an idea of the look and feel of those templates, going into build infographics is probably the best, um, the best way to change that. Now, um, one of the questions that just came in, is there a way to tra track local job changes since March uh, 2020 lockdowns? Um, any real-time changes in those area? That's going to be something that, that's probably going to have to be brought in from ArcGIS Online. Some of that data is being published from, from Esri's hub. Uh, they have a coronavirus uh, disaster response hub talking about everything from the number of hospital beds to, to actual uh, real life job changes. It's just going to depend on where you are and, and depending on what kind of county data uh, as well as municipal data that's been made available. Um, Um, and again, the report that I'm specifically interested in running here, I'm going to run this new one uh, just so you can take a look at it. It's the coronavirus impact planning. I'll take just a moment for it to generate, but again, this is just going to be based on that five minute drive time. Uh, you're getting population, household size, health insurance data, employee data, daytime population. You also get some at risk data. So if you had a question, as to how many people over the age of 65 there were in the area, or how many households with disabilities, or households without a vehicle. Um, lots of good information there. You can also get the in school enrollment, um, population and poverty status. So, so lots of good data that's really available here in this new coronavirus impacting report. Oops, let me open that to go to our next 
little exercise, and that's going to be exercise four. This is the comparison uh, benchmark. What we're going to do here is we're going to create an MSA, the entire market area um, of Phoenix. So I'm going to go ahead and go over to the right side of my screen. I'm going to clear out my map. And this is uh, something that's been around for a little while, but it's something that I think is kind of hidden within the site. And so what I want to do is I just want to make sure that people are aware of the capability here uh, of really being able to compare different sites. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to select a geography. And I'm interested really in the entire metro area. So I'm just gonna type in Phoenix for my geography. And we're gonna see that I have zip codes, CBSAs, DMAs, cities and towns. Well, if I select the drop down for CBSAs, you'll see that I can create the entire market area here. So the entire CBSA, uh, oops, is my study area. And what I wanna do is I wanna define how many business and facilities, and I'm looking for business, and that business is Chick-fil-A. So I wanna know all the Chick-fil-A's that are within my market area. And so I could do this by specific type of industry. I could go into auto or clothing or restaurants, uh, you know, specific types of business. But in this case, I'm actually interested in a specific business. Now, if you wanted to look for multiple businesses, maybe you wanted Chick-fil-A and, um, Popeyes and KFC, well, you could separate them with a semicolon, but in this case, we're just looking for the Chick-fil-A. And let's just pretend for a moment, like we're interested in, you know, what is it that really makes these Chick-fil-A's tick? So we have their location data now, so you can see where they've all mapped. Um, and you can see that there's 33 of them. There's uh, 32 Chick-fil-A's and then there's this Chick-fil-A retail. Now, Let's say that we're not really interested in the Chick-fil-A retail. We're only interested in the 32 actual businesses. Now, what we could do is we could export this. And I have that available now. Um, and just so you can have a little bit more information about what we're looking at here, these are the locations. If you're wondering why you see numbers like six and seven, that's some clustering that's occurring based on how close to uh, each other those businesses are. If you wanna get rid of that, you can just click next and you can uncluster those points and you can see where each of those different Chick-fil-A locations are. Um, and this is not something new, but just so you know, uh, you can import your own custom symbol. Once you've done that, they're saved permanently in your custom logo database. So uh, you can see that I have a number of different businesses this is here. If I want a Chick-fil-A to show up, I can do that. I can change the size of the Chick-fil-A logo, depending on how I want to do that. I could say next, I could save the layer and bring it up again in the future. <clears throat> But in this case, let's just say, you know what, all I really wanted was that Excel spreadsheet because what I wanted to do is take that and I'm gonna go ahead and clear out the existing Chick-fil-A's. What I wanna do is I wanna take that list and I wanna edit that list down a little bit. So I'm gonna open that screen up. And here's my Chick-fil-A locations. And you can see that I've got my business name, address, city, state, and zip code. Let's say in this case that I wanna get rid of that last location, that retail location. I could just take that column, or that row rather, and then I'm gonna save it. So now you can see that I have 32 Chick-fil-A locations in the Phoenix MSA. And what I wanna do now is I actually wanna add that to the map. So I'm gonna say add data, import the file. Now I could have certainly just left it on there, but I was just showing you if you also had a list that you wanted to import onto the map how you could do that. You're just going to take that Excel spreadsheet and we're going to use the point locations, address, city, state, and zip code. It's going to take just a moment for those to map and then you're going to see where they populate. Okay. And what I'm going to do is let's just say that I'm, I believe that a Chick-fil-A study area is a two mile ring. And I want to compare all 32 of these different sites based on a two mile ring. So I'm going to go ahead and select my ring studies and I'm going to go ahead and save this. So it's actually taking all 32 of those different uh, points, creating a two mile ring around them, and then I'm going to be able to create a comparison report. So if I wanted to, I could run individual reports on each and every one of those sites. That's not what I'm interested in doing. What I want to do is be able to compare the different sites, see if I can figure out, you know, what is it that makes a Chick-fil-A location tick? Is it um, 
Is it things like population? Is it things like income? Uh, there's any number of different things it could be, but um, I'm interested in doing a little bit of research to better find out exactly what I can do here. So uh, you can see, it takes just a moment because I am saving 32 different sites. Um, and you can see that it's just running down here at the bottom of the screen. I'm gonna have these 32 different sites that I can view side by side. So I'm gonna select run reports. And you'll see that immediately it thinks I'm wanting to run 32 different reports, civilian labor force profiles. That's not the case. I'm wanting to go into comparison. What it's gonna do is it's going to pick up all those 32 different sites and it's gonna give me the data of my previously created comparison report. Now, I might wanna create my own comparison report using the variables that I'm interested in. So uh, to do that, I'm gonna say, I wanna create a new report and I'm gonna clear my variables and I'm gonna to start to choose the variables that are important to me. So maybe I'm in population, maybe I'm interested in income and um, maybe I'm interested in households. I want to know about the total number of households and the average household. And maybe I'm interested in education level. Choose all these different variables, businesses, jobs, policy, tapestry segments. If there's a certain tapestry segment that I thought might be relevant, um, I might say, you know, I think that um, uh, Chick-fil-A typically does really well with professional pride or boom burbs or savvy suburbanites or uh, urban chic or uh, enterprising professionals or laptops and lattes. Well, so we can go in and we can create all of these different, um, choose all of these different variables. And then once we've done that, we can click apply. So um, we get a very basic spreadsheet here uh, showing us our Chick-fil-A and then our corresponding um, data for population, household income, uh, and we can start to determine what it is that makes these locations tick. But what I wanted to do is just show you a couple of additional things that you can do here. So one, you can switch the rows and the columns if you would prefer to see these uh, locations a little bit differently. If you want to see the locations in columns and the data in rows versus the opposite, you can do that. You just click on this little switch rows and columns. Uh, you also have the option to come in here and let's say that um, we've done a little research and we've determined that Chick-fil-A location and the entire MSA was Chick-fil-A location number 27. So what I can do is if I click on the ellipses out to the right of the study area, I can actually make that the benchmark. And so when I make that color-coded Excel file where uh, I'm gonna be able to compare uh, the different demographic characteristics of this market with all of the other different sites. And I can see just how different my study area is or this top performing store is versus the other ones. And you can notice I can change my ranges, my style uh, to make this look however I want to, but it's just kind of an interesting way of, of viewing this. And then one other thing you can do is if you go into the ad sites, you can click on statistical comparisons. And if you wanted to get the average of all the sites or the median of all the sites, you could add those two variables as well. So if I wanted to know what all of the Chick-fil-A's, they average about, um, let's see, total population of right around 50,000 within that two mile ring, median household income of about 63,000. Um, let's see, what's that? Average household income a little bit higher at 88,000. Um, total households about 20,000. So we can start to get a feel for, you know, what the characteristics are of this of, of this business that make it click. And so I just think that this comparison report tool, the idea that you can just import them, quickly create a study area, a comparison report is a pretty effective way uh, to be able to visualize this data. And then the export, you know, if you wanted to export the data, you can just simply click export and you're gonna get this Excel spreadsheet that's gonna show us all of that information side by side. So that's the idea of the comparative reporting that can be done. Oops. So the next thing I wanna do, scrolling through here, 
We're going to talk about the void analysis. So let's pretend for a moment like we work in economic development for Pima County and market research has led us to believe that we need to figure out a way to attract new dental offices uh, to our county. And we're hoping that one of the existing dental groups that has two or more locations in Maricopa County and no existing locations in Pima County might be interested. So this is the new void analysis tool. Um, so what I'm going to my map and I'm going to go ahead and clear it out. I'm going to start over and I'm going to start by beginning creating my study area of Pima County. So Pima County is the county in theory that we're working for. And you can see the delineation there. Oops. And then I'm gonna define my area as oops, Maricopa County. And I'm gonna go ahead and choose that county as well. So I've got these two counties that I've created. I'm getting an error. I think I'm actually logged into the site twice right now. That's why you're seeing that. Um, so I have my Pima County and my, P, uh, my Maricopa County. Um, and maybe I'll make this look a little bit different. I'll go in here and I'll change from green outline. I'm gonna make this orange and I'm gonna fill it in. And my Pima County, I'm gonna go in and change it to blue. So we've got these two different study areas that I can see on the map. Now, in our exercise, we've determined that we are uh, underserved in the dental market in Pima County compared to uh, Maricopa County. And we're trying just trying to get a feel for what businesses are up here that we don't currently have down here. And so in order to do so, to get that list, what we can do is we can run an analysis as a void analysis to determine uh, what those businesses are. So if we select our analysis area, our analysis area is going to be oops, Pima County. And then our reference area, the area that we are looking at, is going to be Maricopa County. And so we have these two study areas selected. And now if we click next, we can enter a business name, just like we did with Chick-fil-A just a moment ago or we can go in and we can actually search for specific types of businesses. So in this case, if we're interested in dental offices, we could type in dentists or we could click on the drop down for healthcare and we would see that the third option down is dentists. So if I click okay, I'm done. And now just so you can see, if I clicked on more options, you can notice I also have the option to type in NAICS code or SIC codes, um, but I'm gonna go ahead and run the analysis. And so what this is telling me is I've got all these businesses in Pima County and in Maricopa County. Uh, we've got uh, 1,700 dental offices in Maricopa County and only 311 in Pima County. And what you see is within our reference area, we have the top business name. So Aspen Dental has 13 locations in Maricopa County, only three in Pima County. And so that is a gap of 10. Well, one of the things that's not really taking into account is, is the fact that the population difference is, is pretty substantial here. Uh, there's a whole lot more people that live in Maricopa County than there are in Pima County. Um, and so one of the new capabilities here is if we were to click on view full table, you can see the entire breakdown of the businesses, but you'll notice up at the top of the screen, there's also an option to normalize results. So when I say normalize results, you might be thinking, well, what does that mean? Well, what if we wanted to adjust this uh, to where we could normalize the results by population? Meaning if Maricopa County and uh, Pima County had the same population, how um, dental offices would we expect to be in Pima County? So if we normalize the results, what we would find is instead of the gap being 1,400, that the, the, the only difference is actually gonna be 98. So if Pima County was the same size as Maricopa County, we'd be to expect uh, that there'd be 820, so there would be a difference of 98. Um, so you can normalize the results as well, or you can say, you know what, I'm not interested in normalizing the results, I just wanna see the actual data here. So one of the interesting things that you can view here is um, you can notice the color change between the blue and the red on 
So anytime you see red, what that denotes is, is there an, there's an entire void in the market. So there are no DC dentals in Pima County. There are no Arizona Dental Pro PCs. There's no IV2 Dental. There's uh, no Arizona Orthodontic Studio, no Comfort Dental, no Dunn Orthodontics. And so if you were trying to call on someone um, in the dental world, trying to get a feeling for, hey, maybe you'd be interested in opening up a new practice down here in Tucson, um, you could, these would be some that you might consider reaching out to first. And if you export the results, uh, then you have additional information about those businesses as well, such as their location. So um, that's the void analysis tool. Um, it's something that um, Esri has been doing a lot of work on lately. And I think that the, the, the results are, are really outstanding. Um, and, and you can really get a feel for uh, if there's a specific type of business actual business that you are looking for uh, or category of businesses, you can certainly uh, seek those out, get a better feel for, for what might be an opportunity in, in a place where you might be working. So the next thing that we're going to talk about is the suitability analysis. Um, and so if you haven't spent any time with suitability analysis, this is actually my favorite new uh, tool that is available within the site. Um, it's about a year old, but some of the new capabilities available within the site or within uh, suitability analysis have really changed this, made it a much more valuable tool in my opinion. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to show you real quickly, again, I'm going to show you a spreadsheet. So um, this is a list of restaurants. That is uh, it's a restaurant chain, and they have locations in Southern California, uh, Northern California, and then they've just franchised out to a uh, franchisee in Colorado in the Denver area. And you can see that they have um, seven new locations in, in, in Fort Collins and Denver area. And then we also have their corresponding sales data. So that's information that we actually had um, that we were able to bring in. And we took the information, we put business name, we just put the store name, um, store one all the way through, I believe it's 40 locations. Yes, 40 locations. Um, we have the address, city, state, zip code, and sales volume. Now, what I want to tell you about uh, this column F, uh, sales volume, this can be anything with a number attached to it. So if you're talking about square footage, if you're talking about price per square foot, if you're talking about a uh, number of parking spots, if you're talking about traffic counts, you can take this information and you can upload it into the map. So the idea behind suitability analysis is that you can take information, your own information, and use it in conjunction with Esri's data. And so let me show you just a little bit how, about how this actually works. So I'm going to start by clearing my map. And I'm going to add data to my map. So add data, import file. Oops. Browse, and the name of my file was restaurants. Import that file. And there's two different ways that we can import the data. If we have the address, we can map that by point location data. If we didn't, we could use geographic bounds. In this case, I have the addresses of the locations, so I'm going to use point locations. But just keep in mind that if you had data that was li linked to things like counties or zip codes or census blocks, you could use geographic boundaries instead of an actual address. I'm going to go ahead and choose point locations. And next, I know that we have address, city, state, and zip code in the column header, so I'm going to go ahead and click next again. And it's going to show where those 40 locations are. Now, you can see that they cluster heavily in the San Diego, LA area, as well as in Northern California, uh, and then finally in Denver. And let's just say for our purposes, we're going to create individual sites from these study areas that are, I don't know, maybe a five minute drive time. And we're going to name this layer Restaurant Chain and Expansion Mode. So we're going to go ahead and save this. And it'll take just a moment because what it's doing is it's actually taking uh, not only those five minute drive times that have been created, but it's also taking the corresponding sales data and it's importing it, that data into the site. And so we now have what's called an attribute 
uh, that is associated with that site. And we can use that in mapping just like we would use median household income or population or population density or race and ethnicity data. So it is that you're interested in being able to view, you can pull that information in. It's going to take just a moment for those to create. And now we have 40 sites that have been created that we can look at side by side. Now, if I wanted to compare these sites by demographic factors, I certainly could create a comparison report. But in this case, what I'm actually interested in doing is creating a suitability analysis. So I'm going to select suitability analysis. And you see that I have my 40 different stores. I'm going to click next. And now we get to the point where we get to add criteria. So there's different layers for, for criteria. There's the data browser, which is things like population, income, age, households, education data. All of that data comes directly from Esri. And I can use as many of those variables as I want. But in this case, let's just say that the only thing I'm actually interested in is being able to look at the sales data for my locations. And I want to be able to view that data on the map. So if I select the second option, which is add attributes from sites, for example, square footage, I can choose sales volume. And so what you can see here is I've got all these different points, but I'm zoomed out so far that it's kind of hard for me to see which site scores the best all the way down to the poorest from a sales volume standpoint. But what I can do is I can click on show locations only, and it'll actually show those locations ranked by the numerical bubbles. So if I click on show locations only, I can see all those locations side by side, and I can get a feel for how well these locations are doing. So for example, I noticed that my number one location in the entire chain is here in the Long Beach area. My second store is the Thousand Oak store, and you can see that they're really all over the place after that. Well, what if we wanted to do a little more further analyses here? We can actually filter this. So for example, if I wanted to look at my top five stores, I could see that four of them are in Southern California, one of them up in the Bay Area. What if I wanted to look at the poorest performing five stores? I'd see one's in LA, one's in Denver, and three of them are in the Bay Area. What if I wanted to look at my top 15 stores? I would find that none of my new stores in the Denver market are top 15. In fact, 14 of the 15 stores are doing better in the LA area than they are anywhere else. And so it really just helps to be able to tell the story of information that you would normally be able to see in just a spreadsheet. Once you can map it and be able to use that data, you can really help better tell the story. You can do this with any kind of numerical data, whether it's, like I said, traffic counts, household income, if you wanted to add an additional variable to this, you could do so. So for example, if I said, well, I want to take this data and I think it's important, but I'm also interested in adding additional sites or looking at additional variables, I could do all those things. So I could say, oh, I want to look at that, but I also want to look at income. And so, so now, instead of just looking at one variable, I can look at two variables at once. I could say, I think that income is actually more important than my existing sales volume. So I could rank these diff more differently. I can adjust them however I want to, to better tell that story. So that is uh, the ability to create a suitability analysis. Again, something that's new to the site, but is really an outstanding capability. Now, the last thing that I want to show you how to do is to work on multiple variable mapping within a market area. So if we go to our spreadsheet, what if we wanted to look at Maricopa County and we were looking for goods that have the highest population density and median household income, but we wanna look at that information at the same time. So we could start off by defining our area as Maricopa County, or I could go into my project. And because I've already created this, I could pull up the information there. So we could do it that way, or I could just say define areas. 
I'm interested in Maricopa County, Arizona. We can see that study area. If we wanted to click on it, we could create a site. If we wanted to associate a picture with it, we could do that, that we could then turn around and use. But in this case, what we want to do is we want to create a color-coded map only based on Maricopa County. So I said I was interested in population. And so I'm going to create a color-coded map by population. But as you can see, it maps all over the place. I'm not interested in everything. I'm just looking at the county. So there you can see only the zip codes that are within Maricopa County, or at least touching Maricopa County. But what if I said, I actually want to look at multiple things at once. Right now I'm looking at population, but I also have the option to add an additional variable. And maybe I'm interested in median household income. And at first you're going to see that the population density is going to be on the color scale and then the median household income is going to be the size of the circle. So that's the way that the system decided to map it. But we're not limited to that. We actually have other options as far as what we can do uh, to make this show up the way that we want it to. If we select style, you'll notice that we have other options. So for example, what if I wanted to look at this data by dot density with a color-coded map? Here, you could see that my dot value represents my population and the color represents, hold on, I'm gonna switch the variables here. And so now what I have is my dot value represents my population and my color represents my income. So I can go in and I can change these however I want to. And then the other option that I have, and this is something that's new, what if I start off by population? And then I determine I want to look at an additional variable. So I want population and I also want income. This next option is called bivariate mapping. And what that's going to do is it's going to create this box. And right now it's a three by three box. So in the bottom left hand corner, we're going to have the lowest income as well as the lowest population. As we move up to the top right, you'll find that the darker colors are going to be our highest population as well as our highest median household income. So right now we're looking at this by three classes, but if I wanted to, I could change it to four so I could have additional colors and I can get a feel for all of the places that best meet my criteria. And so if I hover over these areas, if I know that I'm looking for these two variables, I can see this Gilbert, Chandler, Goodyear and Peoria are probably going to be my, uh, as well as Scottsdale, a couple of different zip codes in Scottsdale are also going to my, meet my criteria. Uh, if I say, well, um, why are these areas not meeting my criteria? The population is plenty high, but the income is not quite as high. And that's traditionally the case in the city core. As you move out, you'd get into lower populations, but higher median household incomes. And so that's just the new bivariate mapping. Again, you can get to it just by choosing two different variables within color-coded maps. So at first glance, you think, oh, well, I can only map one thing at a time. So maybe I was interested in median age. And you can map, map single variables here, but if you want to, you can actually add additional variables. So that's a new capability within the site. We've always had the ability to map up to five different uh, variables within the smart map tool. Um, but as far as the, creating an actual color coded map, we've been limited uh, to just one. So there's one other question that just came in and uh, those are all of the new things um, that, that we really have to talk about today. So I, I hope you feel like you learned coming in about how can we look at population growth in an area. Um, so there's a couple of different ways we can do that. Um, we can go into create maps and we can go to color coded maps and we could look at population and we could look at our annual growth rate. And there you can see um, which zip codes or counties or 
since his tracks are growing the fastest, that would be one way that you could look at it. Um, but there's an additional way that I actually really like to be able to view this information. And what it involves doing is actually creating my own custom variable. So if I go into population and I select create your own population variable, what I can do is I can select 2020-25 population and I can subtract out the existing 2020 population. And so what this is showing me as opposed to an annual growth rate, this is all about the actual number of new people expected. So this is total new population over the next five years. And so this is just a custom variable, which can be very helpful for a number of different reasons. If you're looking for, um, um, if, you're, if you're interested in um, senior living facilities and you're wanting to know people over the age of you know, certain age groups, or maybe you're interested in student housing, you're interested in a certain segment of age that otherwise doesn't pop up, you can always create your custom variable to reflect exactly what it is that you're looking for. And so here, if we look at this by zip code, you can see where the population um, is changing uh, significantly. So if we said, well, we're only interested in places uh, where, you know, there's going to be at least, you know, 6,000 uh, people in, in the area coming in, you could go in and you could say, oh, okay, well, then I can filter this and I can say, I'm looking for places where there will be more than 6,000 people. Or you can edit the different ranges as well. So maybe you say, oh, well, this is two different ranges and you can adjust the map accordingly to tell the story how you're trying to tell it. So let's see. A couple of questions that I've just saw come in. Yeah, so one of the questions it was uh, about the, the, the Chick-fil-A um, exercise that we were doing earlier. Um, if we were trying to figure out what other areas met those criteria, you could you could kind of seek out uh, the different variables that were that were similar. Um, that'd be one one way. Um, another question that just came in is: Do do we have any virtual assistants uh, that can be hired to do analysis? We're actually getting ready to unveil our new concierge program. Uh, we think that that'll probably be ready to go by the end of the month. Um, and what that will involve is is just you having access to site to do business, but hiring one of the site to do business staff. Uh, to go in and run reports for you, uh, to go in and create story maps, uh, market analysis, whatever it is that you're looking to do. Um, and of course, there'll be a, a charge associated with that, but, but you will be able to um, hire people by the hour to do this kind of thing. If it's not something that you're interested in doing, but, but realize the value, uh, again, we anticipate that being available by the end of uh, the month. Uh, as, far, as far as where the information is coming from, that's a great question. Um, if you go to site to do business and you go to the Learning Center, uh, the Learning Center has a resource page where almost all of the data comes from. So certainly there's a lot of information that is pulled from um, the Census Bureau and then projected forward. Um, we also have uh, data partners such as AGS, which is uh, the FBI as far as crime data. We have uh, tapestry data from Esri, which is lifestyle segmentation. Um, Media Mark uses uh, all the market potential data, There's credit card information that goes into this as far as uh, sales and expected sales. Um, of labor statistics as well. So there's, there's a whole number of resources uh, that are available to you if you're wondering where all this stuff is coming from. Uh, lots of different information there from, from the resource page of the Learning Center. Uh, Learning Center is also good if you're wanting to sign up for future webinars, if you want to view a, a past webinar, also these How Do I videos uh, from basic logging in to pretty advanced things like um, uh, the person who is interested in the Chick-fil-A uh, exercise. Um, if you were trying to find other areas that might uh, that are outside of the Phoenix MSA that might kind of meet the criteria, you could analyze an area using consistent geographies. I feel like that's a really good one. That's a little more involved, but um, but definitely a good exercise if you're really wanting to pinpoint your site selection uh, prowess. See if there's anything else. Let's see. Um, 
let's see. The only other question that I saw come through is, can you share this document? Absolutely. Uh, my latest and greatest, um, you can certainly work back through this uh, after today's presentation. I think that, that would be uh, probably very helpful uh, if, if you're trying to learn how to use uh, the tools that I was talking about today. So I can send this out in the, um, if you'll just reach out to me directly, actually, if this is something that you're interested in having, um, I can be reached at bwilson at ccim.com. Again, that's bwilson at ccim.com. Uh, you can also find my information here in the contact us section of the Learning Center, uh, just because I'm gonna send out the archived um, presentation is going to is going to come in your your post session follow up. Um, but I don't have the ability to edit that that'll just automatically go out. So I'll be happy to send this uh, latest and greatest file for you that you can use and I'll also include uh, the documents that I use the Excel files that I use to upload onto the map if you want to play along at home. So uh, I really I'm showing that the time is about 12.20 Central Time, so we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Uh, but any more questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. I'd love to help you however I can. Um, thank you so much, and uh, have a wonderful day. Be safe out there. Thank you.